So I guess uh, in a very German matter, we start uh, right on time. Esteemed panelists, uh, Professor Dr. Abdelmigit Qasim, Professor Dr. Jihan Gouifel, uh, Professor Dr. George Marquis, Ms. Helle Demisch E, Ms. Isabel Mehring, Professor Dr. Verena Blechinger Talcott, Dr. Florian Kurstall, dear alumni and friends of Freie Universität Berlin in Cairo, Berlin, and everywhere else. Ladies and gentlemen, Ahlan wa Sahlan Biku, and welcome to our panel discussion on international academic collaboration, the backdoor remedy to a global crisis. My name is Hodan Mahkoub. I'm the head of the Cairo Liaison Office of FU Berlin, and I'm very happy to be guiding you through our program today that is being held in celebration of our 10-year anniversary of the Cairo Liaison Office of FU Berlin. Before I start, I would like to remind our participants today to please mute your microphones and shut off your cameras. If you have any questions, please make sure to post them in the chat box in the bottom right corner of the platform. We will, of course, get back to these questions as early as possible. As you can all imagine, we were planning to hold this event here in Cairo on site on the beautiful premises of the DAD Cairo office, where our Cairo office is located. But due to the unprecedented circumstances, we had to shift to the digital slash virtual format. As much as it saddens me that we cannot meet face to face, or I guess it would be more appropriate to say that we cannot really interact person to person, I would also like to stress on the point that the COVID-19 dilemma actually has many facets. And this is exactly what we will try to discuss today in the context of international academic collaboration. I mean, most evidently, researchers from all around the world have witnessed limited or complete interruption of their mobility due to COVID-19, and hence part of their activities has been put on hold over the past seven months. Nevertheless, the current crisis has also revealed that there is a mounting necessity of sustained cross-border research networks, which are crucial for academic and research institutions to complement their expertise and scientific reach across closed borders. So the question that we are trying to tackle, or the questions that we are trying to tackle here, is the current situation really a step back, or did it maybe open doors that we would have not knocked on earlier? Having said that, I'm very excited that we have with us today our esteemed array of panelists from Egypt, Lebanon, and Germany. But not only the panelists represent an international mix of experts. We also have a very interesting mix of audience members from Egypt, Germany, Lebanon, Syria, Morocco, Iraq, the UAE, Canada, and Russia. Thanks to the digital means that we have to use nowadays, it might have not been easy to be welcoming colleagues, alumni, and friends of FU Berlin from different parts of the world on, at, on the same day. But now, and without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome and introduce Professor Dr. Verena Blechinger, who is the Vice President of Freie Universität Berlin for International Affairs and Professor of Japanese Politics and Political Economy at FU Berlin. She studied political science, Japanese studies and law in Munich, Kyoto and Tokyo. She received her MA in Japanese studies in 1991 and her PhD in political science in 1997 both from Munich University. After working as a lecturer at Munich University from 1993 to 1997, she joined the German Institute for Japanese Studies in Tokyo in 1997, where she focused on comparative research of Japanese politics and international relations. From 2001 to 2002, she was also deputy director of the German Institute for Japanese Studies. After postdoctoral research as advanced research fellow in the program on U.S.-Japan relations at Harvard University, she was assistant professor in the, de in the Department of Government at Hamilton <laughs> College, Clinton, NY. In 2004, she joined the faculty of FU Berlin. At FU Berlin, she was dean of the Department of History and Cultural Studies from 2007 to 2011 and a member of the Academic Senate from 2013 to 2018. Uh, in 2018, she was elected and appointed Vice President for International Affairs at Freie Universität Berlin. That is actually the same year I started the work at FU Berlin, and I think ever since Professor Blechinger was planning to come and pay the Cairo office a visit. Even though the plans had to be postponed, I'm extremely happy that you are with us today, Professor Blechinger. The floor is yours. 
Thank you very much for the the nice uh, introduction. Um, yeah, I'm actually very sad that I cannot be physically present in, in Cairo right now to celebrate the, the 10th anniversary of our liaison office. Um, nevertheless, I think it's great to have this virtual event today and I'm really excited to be part of it. So let me start my official words of greeting. Dear uh, Professor Dr. Abdel Megid Kassem, dear Professor Professor Dr. Georges Marquis, dear Professor Dr. Chihan Gewaifel, dear Hala Dimeshki, dear Isabel Mehring, dear Professor Dr. Lina Chueri, dear Hoda El Magup, and if I may say, even if he's sitting just a few doors over, dear Florian Kostal, um, dear colleagues, uh, students, and friends, as Vice President for International Affairs at Freie Universität Berlin, I would cordially uh, like to welcome you to all. Uh, all to this virtual celebration of the 10th anniversary of the Freie Universität Berlin Cairo Liaison Office. It is my great pleasure to say a few words before today's panel discussion on international academic collaboration um, in times of global crisis. And um, maybe as part of the welcome at a 10 year anniversary, let me also look back to the times when uh, the liaison office in Egypt was actually about to be founded. When Freie Universität Berlin decided to strengthen its international outlook and develop the plan to create a network of liaison offices around the world more than 10 years ago, it was clear from the very beginning that one of these offices should be in the Arab-speaking world. The reason for that was obvious. The university, our university, FU Berlin, is probably one of the strongest in Germany when it comes to Middle Eastern studies in the widest sense. We are very proud of our Institute of Islamic Studies, of our Arabic literature program, and our Semitic Languages Institute. We also have colleagues, uh, for example, in archaeology, political science in environmental and climate studies and in veterinary medicine who all worked then and are still working now in the region and with partners in the region so definitely the arab world was a place where we wanted to have a liaison office but where to put it so we discussed the arab speaking region is huge and the research interests of and partners of our researchers were distributed from the maghreb in the west to the gulf region in the east but when we discussed this issue with our colleagues it soon became clear that everyone would be happy to have the office in cairo and this is not only because the the AD offered us a beautiful office space within their center, which I'm very much looking forward to see at some point um, during my term as vice president. But also because the conditions in Egypt are in many ways particularly good. The strong <laughs> academic culture in this country, some excellent universities with a great reputation that goes beyond Egypt, the generally positive attitude towards Germany in general, the pool of great and well-trained young scientists, and not to forget the excellent network of German schools that turn out young people with excellent language skills. So in that way, it was very clear the office should be in Cairo. And over the first 10 years, the Cairo office has played an important role in strengthening our ties to the region, particularly in circumstances that were volatile. Together with our partners in Egypt, our professors have built up strong research networks, among others in the fields of communication studies, literary studies, and political science. And I uh, just saw Ahmed Adala, so also in um, in, in um, anthropology and um, in, in professions linked to to medicine in a in a wider uh, way. We have conducted a unique project with Alexandria, Cairo, Sohak, and South Valley University in the field of gender studies that in the end laid the foundations for a master's program in gender studies at Cairo University. And under the leadership of the American University in Cairo, we collaborated in a project on technology transfer that resulted in the establishment of technology transfer offices at Egyptian universities. Cairo and Beirut, count both among the most important destinations for our direct exchange program students. 
And each year, we receive numerous bachelor, master, and PhD candidates from Egypt, from Lebanon, and the Middle East on our campus in Berlin. These few examples illustrate that academic exchange with Egypt and the Middle East affects all members and all groups of our university, students, faculty members, our staff, and of course also the leadership of our university. So I was told that there is an Egyptian saying that Freie University, that, that when you drink the waters of the Nile, and in a way, Freie Universität Berlin has drunk the waters of the Nile. So interestingly enough, the liaison office in Cairo also played an important role for us within the university. Over the years, it became a focal point for everyone in the university that's interested in the region. I'm only exaggerating a bit if I say that some of our Middle Eastern experts met more often in Cairo than at home in Berlin. So now we are in times of a crisis. COVID-19 has hit globally and has affected international um, relations at, in general, but also at universities. And so here, since we have a panel discussion on this topic, um, here are a few thoughts on, on this topic, maybe to start off our discussion with. The liaison offices have been a unique strength for the Freie Universität Berlin for over a decade, especially in their specific support of academic collaboration. And this strength is all the more apparent now in times of crisis and under the shock of COVID-19. The liaison offices offer support locally in international cooperation, both for academics from the Freie and also locally for those who are interested in studying at the FU or doing their PhD or coming as a researcher to spend some time here to collaborate with our uh, staff and uh, scholars. As such, we often like to compare our liaison office network to the ambassador model. The first phase that you see is the one of the liaison office, and the liaison office promotes research results and new projects from the Freie Universität in the region where they are active and they also inform students and academics about the modalities to come and join us. But more than this, only through our liaison offices, we can establish and maintain local networks, research networks, but also networks in the context of uh, international exchange that are so crucial for successful academic cooperation and for pursuing a research agenda that transcends national boundaries and opens new horizons for scientific inquiry. Our liaison officers, like Hoda El Magoub, are true experts in their field as they know how to navigate between cultures and to mediate between them. This support is all the more important in times of crisis in which the liaison officers act as lifelines to enable continued academic collaboration even in times where we cannot physically travel. Generally speaking, the rather sudden switch to a virtual um, environment has worked out quite well for us at Freie Universität Berlin and our various collaborations. In teaching, for example, we could actually make sure that we could um, do, I think it was 86% of all our classes, we could actually teach online. There were just a few that required practical um, practical exercises, like for example, in pharmacology, where, we, where people have to be physically in the lab to learn to use the equipment. These were things that we did then over the summer in kind of block seminars, but all our teaching worked digitally. We also uh, continued our research networks in the digital environment, but at the same time, it has hit us hard. Even the best conference, like the one that we are doing now, cannot replace direct talks, cannot replace negotiations on joint collaborative projects. Some things are better discussed over a cup of coffee or over dinner um, in a more informal environment that you cannot have when you just see each other on a screen. Travel restrictions for students and young researchers are even harder because we as established researchers, we have our, we know 
counterparts and we worked together in the past. But for young students, for postdocs, um, for doctoral candidates, it's much more crucial to their career path to actually be in touch with scholars, to form networks, to discuss research collaborations, to think about how to do the next panel for an international conference. And here it is true that we have the digital networks to keep us alive, but we have to also be careful to reach out to those who don't have the access as easily as we are having it when we are in our established context. So this is something that is a, a responsibility for us as a university, reaching out, enabling younger scholars, helping them, building networks, things that they cannot do on their own so easily in these difficult times. For Freie Universität, the current crisis is therefore also a chance to reassess and to rethink internationalization. And today's panel provides me with the unique opportunity to discuss some of these ideas directly with you, our partners. Let me only very briefly mention five points which I think are crucial for our future cooperation. First, don't single out COVID-19 as the major crisis. COVID-19 is a serious crisis, but it is one among others. If we want to think about sustainable solutions, we should not forget other challenges, climate change, social inequality, and others. And we have to think of them together and not separately. Second, transnational research cooperation has become even more important in times of this current crisis. We have to mobilize all digital and analog means in order to facilitate this cooperation. There is a trend in, um, in scholarship and in university administration in times of crisis to fall back to your local networks. But there is no German only mathematics. Medical research needs to work in international collaboration to really get a wide enough sample of cases to consider and to make generalizable statements. So international cooperation is now more important than ever. Third, cooperation between the so-called global north and the so-called global south becomes even more important in these times because of the increasing interdependencies that are reinforced by global crisis. We need to work on new instruments to make this cooperation a cooperation between equal partners that look at each other eye to eye, or as we in German say, auf Augenhöhe. Fourth, Especially during this crisis, it is very important to work on new forms of mobility. Our students today are the researchers of tomorrow. As long as borders are closed, we need to work on new means of virtual mobility, such as opening courses online, providing easier access for groups who are disadvantaged, such as refugees. Keep the young people in because they are our future. Don't close career paths too early just because it's not comfortable right now. Fifth, we have to be especially supportive of our faculty members, both the young ones and the established ones. With the switch to online only, their job profile has changed from one day to the other. We all have learned quite a lot over the last month. Um, and that also brings with it new challenges. Um, if you think of balancing, as, as I personally also have done over the last months, balancing online teaching, university responsibility, homeschooling, um, and organizing family life uh, in times of lockdown, that wasn't all easy. Um, so in that way, we have to look out for each other and we have to uh, make sure that we see what new challenges are coming so that people can work together and keep up their hopes. And I'm privileged because I had enough space, but think of students who are also mothers or fathers and uh, maybe families where uh, more persons have to share one computer to do online conferences, homeschooling and uh, regular work. Um, this is all difficult. So this is one reason why we should, by everyone should be included in our debates on the future of internationalization. Having a liaison office is a great privilege to us, especially in these times. The contact with our liaison officer, Hoda El Magub, 
has kept us up to date about the situation in Cairo, even during the times of shutdown. And our liaison office helps us in keeping networks alive that have been established over the years. Therefore, let me thank you, dear Hoda and dear Eman, for your continuous work and for your support during these difficult times. Thank you so much. It is great to have this event today. It is wonderful to be a part of it. And I'm still hoping for a physical visit when it is possible again. But for today, I'm looking forward to a fruitful exchange. Congratulations on 10 years of the liaison office to all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Blechinger. I think you touched on many very important and valid points in regards to the liaison office and the projects that have been done partially because they have been supported uh, due, uh, through the liaisons and at the same time the importance during this um, th these unprecedented times where the network is, uh, whether you have it or whether you have to build it, I think, I personally think this makes a big difference. You also beautifully summarized the, the five big points that we should actually focus on, uh, not only during our panel discussion today, but in general. I think you mentioned words like um, climate change, social inequality. These are topics that cannot be forgotten, um, even though we, we do have a massive uh, problem at the moment going on, which is COVID-19. But these the other topics will remain problematic and still need researchers to work on and people to collaborate in. Also, the point on the transnational research cooperation, I think this is also one of the main points why we are gathered here today, the, the relevance and importance of it cannot be neglected. I will not repeat, of course, what you just said, but I really think that the points that you mentioned um, also built the perfect bridge to our panel discussion, um, also the main reason why we are here today. And you also mentioned, again, the importance of the liaison office. And I think when we say uh, Cairo liaison office, we cannot forget to say uh, Dr. Florian Kostei who uh, will be co-moderating uh, with me today the, the panel discussion. Uh, I'm very happy that he's with us today and I'm very happy that I have been working with him for the past two years. I think um, before I started here, whenever I mentioned, I just mentioned FU Berlin, people immediately say, ah, Florian. So it is, I think uh, Florian kept a, a great uh, brand uh, here in Egypt where he connected FU Berlin with Florian Kostei. So, um, uh, he started in 2010, and I think we can call him one of the founding fathers uh, of the Cairo Liaison Office. And now he's the director of the Berlin, let me check, <laughs> the Global Responsibility Program at FU Berlin. So I think um, if I follow his footsteps, I would have a great uh, career ahead of me. Uh, Florian, very happy to have you with me today, if you'd like to say a couple of words as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anna, for this very touching introduction, and thank you all for being here today. It's really a great moment for me. Uh, I still remember very lively when we celebrated five years of Cairo office, and I would not have, have imagined that I'm still uh, sort of here uh, or somehow present uh, celebrating also the 10th anniversary of uh, the Cairo office. And yeah, I want to congratulate Hoda, of course, uh, for this great success of uh, continuing this work uh, in Cairo, and I would also um, congratulate Emmanuel Mokadem, who has worked for me for a long time before already. I think uh, you are now uh, eight years with uh, the Freie Universität Berlin Cairo office, so um, congratulations, Iman, and keep up the good work. And of course, thank you also, Isabel Mering and the DRD of uh, still hosting us in Cairo. Um, we are today in a virtual event, uh, but nothing can compare in meeting in the garden of the, in the beautiful garden of the DRD, which I would uh, have called really for some time my third home. Um, I very much wish it, it. It is an oasis in Cairo. And uh, yeah, I also, I think this, the last time when I went to Cairo was like one year ago. Um, I still remember or have sort of the brief, the smell of Cairo in my, in my nose when I arrived from the airport and then you suddenly arrive in Zamalek on the island of Zamalek and um, you join this beautiful premises of the DRD, um, which is all uncomparable. But now even with a virtual event, I, virtual event, I really feel it. And I'm very happy to see, of course, so many friends and colleagues and yeah with this no further doing i would like to 
hand over again to Hoda to start uh, our panel debate today. I'm just very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian. So I think we should start right away. Um, we have an interesting array of questions uh, organized for our expert uh, panel uh, today. And we'll start right away with away. Professor Dr. Jihan Goefel, who is a professor of public health at the Faculty of Medicine and is currently working as the assistant vice president of, Alex of the Alexandria University for Education and Student Affairs, as well as the director of the internationalization of higher education and global and the global engagement office. Uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Jihen, uh, I think you are being on the crossroads between the internationalization and, and the global engagement office, and at the same time, you're also uh, a medical professional. So I think you, you have a couple of hats on today. Uh, but I would like to start and ask you directly, in what way did COVID-19 actually impact your partnership with other institutions? And has the current crisis led to the formation of new partnerships or maybe has it intensified old partnerships? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks a lot for this invitation. And I'm very privileged to meet you all online. Uh, to glean and to give some insights into uh, different policies and different actions that were, um, some of them were new, actually newly served on the table uh, to mitigate uh, this pandemic. Um, first, before I mention uh, my answer to your question, Hoda, please, I, I want just to mention something which I think might set the context for all these questions further. Why were some universities so much disrupted and others were not? Why were some of them, um, they reached down until they were bankrupted even, and others were so much affected? Uh, in my opinion, actually, this could be contributed to two factors. The first of which is um, the problem we're having mostly in public universities in Egypt is that we have been building systems that were um, non-adaptable, um, uh, non, um, um, uh, let me say, flexible or resilient, uh, to, to, to face any further unprecedented changes like what we are having now. For a long time, even for years, we have educated students the same way. Uh, we built infrastructures and business models uh, that have what, what you can say, um, a very high operative leverage with fixed cost. We had a lot of, um, uh, we didn't anticipate such a problem. So the first problem is lacking of adaptability. The second problem, which I think has been facing both the health system and the higher education, is that they, they have not been disrupted by any problem like what we're facing now for years. Uh, we didn't face it. So we were vulnerable, and this COVID unmasked our vulnerability. This is what we are facing for the time being, specifically when it came to uh, um, uh, the non-scalable assets we're having in most of the public university, the faculty, the staff that were not ready to change or uh, their mindset, they were not ready for any modification or changes. This we might discuss later, but this, in my opinion, is the start or the reason of any disruption in most of the universities. And of course, a very important fact is um, that w none of our universities are planned with what we call the future planning for something like what we're facing. Uh, what we're facing now, it passed all through the stages of a crisis. It's starting as emergency, moved to crisis, and then uh, uh, disaster, and then crisis, which all could be managed just by prevention. But then the stages after which what we call the agility management or the acceleration management, none of our universities were aware of this. So this is the problem uh, that even what the coping mechanism we're using now are not sustainable. We cannot keep them for a long time. So these are the three main problems, I think, which might set the context for most of these problems. Regarding the partnership, just as I handled the internationalization in this office, I had to set priorities for uh, internationalization. Will it be the mobilization of uh, under or graduate students, or it's better to move to uh, get international curriculum and international um, uh, bachelor degrees to my students? And I prefer the second, actually. So I prioritized and I set my policy to encourage dual and um, uh, joint degrees. And this was the main problem with my partnership, Hada, actually, because um, actually, uh, let me tell you, uh, the most recent in our pipeline for the partnerships 
and it was something really peculiar and we've been envied for it that we have been uh, planning for a, a dual degree in medicine with Manchester University. And let me tell you, this is the first dual degree, actual dual degree in medicine in Egypt and in all Arab countries. Most of the degrees, uh, the dual uh, degrees, as mentioned, they are not actual dual degrees having both stamps of the two universities. On the contrary, it's just an enhancement of the curricula or what we call them recognition, which just a very pre preliminary stage in um, partnerships. So this, uh, it was supposed to be materialized and start in September 2020. The problem is that uh, the British side, they insisted to choose uh, the faculty to teach in this program. They insisted to choose their students. They insisted to do the capacity building for the teachers um, or the faculty in general. So it's tough, uh, despite we reached very advanced stages, even we reached uh, the, the resolution of disputes and it was ready to be signed and hopefully we'll sign it within a couple of weeks, but we couldn't materialize it or start the program this year. So we postponed it to next year. Many other partnerships were delayed, either signed and couldn't be materialized. Others were ongoing. Let me give you just one example of the most successful for us. It's our partnership with Chicago University. Chicago is ranked the first on the world in political science and the third in economics. We had a very successful uh, partnership actually, and that what I consider one of my success in, uh, in this university actually, because uh, uh, each year she picks uh, two or three of our um, eminent, uh, academically um, uh, eminent students and these go there for one whole academic year and it could be extended if their uh, academic transcript is highly uh, accomplished well and they stay there for whole year. We sent last year uh, two students and then this year we selected the new students and they passed all the stages of the process and then it stopped because of COVID. Shanghai University, we're having a lot of uh, negotiation and it, it, we, we signed and then it stopped. A lot of partnerships actually they stopped either to be signed or to be materialized or they were already present but couldn't be sustained. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I can add more if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just would like to comment on a couple of points. Um, thank you for mentioning, of course, the downsides of having to work with a crisis like this um, from the point of view of a state university. I think there is a big difference. If somebody has the microphone on, I think you can just. Yeah, um, I just have a, a, sl a small question that maybe you can answer later on, or this is maybe also an answer for, for all the, our panelists today. Do you feel that there is a difference from the time the whole crisis started, which is seven months ago, till today? Is there some sort of progress? Are there lessons learned uh, where you can say we were, yes, we had these problems, we had these disadvantages, but we learned how to work with it, how to work around it, I think there has also been um, a governmental decision from the Supreme uh, Council of Universities that they now accredit also online courses, something which has not been there before the crisis. So if you'd like to just shortly comment on this point and then we move on. Actually, we have a lot of lessons, but you maybe specified a couple of points, uh, but the best actually of the lessons we got here actually uh, mainly two. Um, and I think this should have been uh, the start of the conversation, the impact we're having. We had uh, hazardous uh, financial uh, um, disruptions. We had um, a lot, but, but let me first start from the end. You mentioned this amendment, legislative amendment, which for us is um, uh, actually um, a victory because a long time ago we had a lot of partnerships which stopped and they were mainly depending on a complete or partial online uh, uh, partnership, uh, either to earn degrees or uh, uh, courses or, or just certificates, whatever, and they always stopped officially because we didn't have any legislation for online or hybrid uh, learning. Or, or exams, electronic exams. What happened, and I think it's the best we benefited, are two things. We got uh, in August uh, amendment of legislation 179, 
which allowed hybrid learning uh, in certain percentages even, and I consider them very high percentages, 30 to 40 percent of uh, theoretical or humanistic um, colleges, like a Faculty of Arts, for example, and these should be online learning and other, um, excuse me, it's the opposite. 30 to 40 percent of uh, uh, colleges like medicine and practical uni uh, faculties should be online teaching and the remaining face-to-face. Uh, -face. Meanwhile, humanistic faculties, it should go up to 40 to 50 percent to be online and the remaining um, to be face-to-face. -face. This is hybrid. Uh, and then uh, regarding the exams, it was the first time in our history to have electronic exams to be allowed and legislated uh, legitimate by the Supreme Council. Uh, we had it softly in some faculties, like in Faculty of Medicine, and they were just formative uh, assessment all through the year and electronically corrected. But we never had summative exams or summative assessment to be uh, le uh, legitimate or legitimate uh, through the Supreme Council, except during the COVID, which is very beneficial for us, actually. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jehan. Um, I think there is progress, uh, not only on the level of the universities and institutions, but also on the more legislative level from the ministries as well. Florian? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, before we proceed, uh, actually, I would suggest that we call all the panelists now on the podium. And the podium means here uh, turning your camera on. <laughs> so that would be uh, Professor Abdel Magid Kasim. Professor George Marquis, um, Hala Dimishki, Isabel Mehring. Yeah, so I think that we are all together and it might be more interactive. Yes, okay. Because the idea is also that you discuss among you, but of course, uh, well, I have some questions. One is uh, in the regard of what Hala has already mentioned. Um, that of course we are still studying how this crisis has affected us. Um, not only in Germany, but also worldwide. And uh, um, we are what we have learned so far, but what is rather an estimate than a certain knowledge, is that this uh, crisis has affected different uh, universities differently. Um, for example, especially those who rely on student fees. And uh, I would like to continue with uh, Dr. George Marquis. Um, you are the Dean of Student Affairs of the American University in Cairo. And uh, actually, uh, um, you provide oversight for key areas related to student life, such as student development, student well-being, conduct, student leadership, and first-year program. And you have also a leading role in increasing internationalization of the American University in Cairo through active partnerships around the globe. Since 2006, you have also been working with the Fulbright, Fulbright program preparing students from the Middle East and North Africa to teach and study in the United States. Now, I would especially ask you about how student life has been going on at the American University in Cairo. As I mentioned already, the COVID crisis 19 might have had even a bigger impact on institutions that rely on student affairs, uh, on, on, on tuition fees. Um, at the same time, I guess that I think AUC has at the moment 6,500 students, uh, is that right? Um, you might have also a better chance to assess the effects of, of uh, turning to digital means of communication, of teaching, etc., and also of mobility. How, is, how has this really affected students' life? What do we know so far and where, what do we don't know? Thank you. Uh, your mic, please. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction. And uh, yes, uh, student life has been affected, although I would say that um, in comparison to what my colleague at Alexandria University was saying, uh, AUC was ahead of the curve uh, for most of this. Uh, we had uh, started very early in two areas is I think that are important to uh, handling any type of a crisis. And that is we had a business continuity plan that had been um, instituted uh, some time back that uh, made uh, all our areas had to um, discuss what would, uh, what would happen in certain scenarios. And one of them was uh, a pandemic. 
And uh, so we had already been talking about something like this uh, way back. A second uh, thing is that we have a center for learning and teaching. And this center has for the last three to four years been uh, teaching faculty how to teach online. And that's because we started with it with an ambitious uh, blended learning program some time back. So we, we, were, we were very fortunate that we had those two um, pieces in place when we went online, which was uh, last, um, last March. We were really prepared to teach online. We also have a very strong uh, infrastructure, technology infrastructure. We have a, a dedicated uh, internet uh, uh, at AUC, and so we are able to, to, to operate well. But what happened was uh, we sent a lot of students home. So we, we first had to evacuate our student residences. When we did that, we had students at home who were unable to fully participate online because the infrastructure where they lived, sometimes in rural areas, was not as strong as it is at AUC. Uh, second is that uh, we had to um, cater to the students who could not go home. Those were some of the uh, Egyptian students whose parents live in the Gulf and they were unable to, to leave. And we also had some international students uh, from other countries who could not go home until the evacuation flights uh, kicked in. And then some chose not to, not to go home. So we actually had to house some students on campus. Now, what with, the, to, with specific regard to student life, we canceled all events. And the reason why we canceled events was because of the um, need to social distance and the uncertainty as to what the um, what 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 the safety and security uh, needs were around uh, events. And so we spent um, the entire uh, late spring and summer preparing a set of guidelines as to if we were to return to any type of events, what could we do and how many people we could could we hold? Up until now, we have not allowed any events to occur on our campus. This has created a, um, a severe disappointment among students because um, in the student on the student life side, the out, outside of class or the co-curricular side, many of these student organizations, they're their, their raison d'etre is events. They, that's what they do. And so without this, it has, it has left, the, for example, the student government with a question of, well, how are we relevant if we aren't on campus? And what they've been doing is trying to, um, to advocate for all sorts of things that they never were interested in before, such as you know, bringing exams onto, onto campus or the tuition fees or so forth. So it has created a sense of frustration among students that they can't meet. They're, you know, young people are very social. Uh, the athletics is another huge area. I am, I'm also over, that's also under my uh, leadership. And we, we cannot hold tryouts as of yet. And we cannot have competitions on campus. We, we talked to the Egyptian uh, Federation, the Sports Federation recently. And if they start to um, hold competitions, you see, even though we are an American university in Egypt and established in the United States, we still are part of so much a part of Egypt. And so we really do have to be in sync with many of the other things that are happening at the other universities. And sports is a very good example of that. And I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Well, let me say, um... You're relatively famous also for piloting a lot of projects together with Egyptian public universities. Are there any uh, projects that you are um, have invented as a response to the COVID-19 crisis together with Egyptian public universities? And maybe you can, do you see them as a role model, etc.? Yes, as a matter of fact, I mean, in addition to the centers of excellence that we partner with many of the Egyptian universities, such as Ain Shams and Alexandria University, we are currently working um, with uh, uh, several Egyptian universities. And um, it's just something that we've just started, and it, and it is around the Center for Student Wellbeing. We have a center for student well-being that houses uh, counseling facilities and facilities for students with disabilities, and we are very proud of the um, 
um, of the uh, assistance and support that we can offer to students with uh, uh, disabilities, physical uh, learning disabilities and psychological disabilities. We are going to, we, when, when, when the virus uh, caused us to shut down, we went online with our counseling and our disability uh, services. We've been providing webinar support. We have had an increase in the number of students who have needed counseling services, sometimes because of the, um, the, 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 the um, difficult situations that they're facing at home, being at home, and they're not used to being around their family so much. So we've had some of that. But what we are doing is we are going to be partnering with the uh, Egyptian universities to um, uh, train and, and mentor uh, psychological advisors at these other universities, particularly those who deal with students with disabilities, and to, sh to teach and to train uh, in how to operate under situation like COVID-19 uh, providing services and being available for students uh, 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 online uh, when when they when they need us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And maybe maybe a short last uh, questions. Could you provide us maybe with? I mean, the students of AUC are also quite famous for being active in community, ser serving the community. Are there any students uh, initiatives that you would like to to mention that have come up uh, recently? Well. Um, we have about five student clubs that are particular that are called community service student clubs, and what they've been doing uh, in 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 in, 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 in uh, being unable to actually go out and visit uh, in the communities, they have been uh, more active online, doing online tutoring. So we have uh, some students doing literacy classes online. We have other students uh, offering uh, assistance and support in uh, teaching uh, um, um, community members how to use social media platforms and uh, and um, um, uh, uh, platforms such as WebEx and Zoom to um, to teach those who teach in and particularly how to teach interactively. So we've been we've had students um, who are trained. To, to do that, working with um, other, with the community, volunteer, NGOs, and so forth, to try and, and help them. And then we've been providing in some way, when we can, um, modems and, um, and, and, and data packages to uh, help them, um, you know, because we know that one of, the, one of the main challenges we have is in the amount of data is, that is used uh, to run a, a Zoom lecture. Or even something like this, we've uh -huh. estimated, you know, that sometimes 20 gigabytes, 40 gigabytes, uh, students just don't have that, um, that, that, uh, the wherewith, the financial wherewithal to keep uh, recharging, and so we we also know that we have to look for solutions in this area. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shosh Marquis. We are we are moving on to to Lebanon and to Mrs. Hala Dimeshki. Um, from the American University in Beirut, but American in the name, but still very much rooted also in the region. Uh, one of the first modern universities in the Middle East. And Hoda is going to ask you a question. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you, Fayo. Yes. Uh, hi, Hel. It's actually very nice for me to finally see you face to face. I think we've been communicating ever since. January 2018, when we started, in, started working together, we have a very strong partnership in Erasmus Plus, and of course also our direct exchange uh, program. Every year when I attend the interviews in Berlin, people are always extremely excited, of course, about the AUB and as well the AUC as well. So I'm very happy to finally see you now face to face. Um, I Hela Demishi is the director of the Office of International Programs at the AUB. She represents and promotes the AUB internationally and supports and disseminates international education within AUB. She's responsible for managing AUB's international office, including international student service and study abroad programs, and for developing and maintaining international partnership agreements that relate to students, faculty, and staff mobility. And I think this is also one of the keywords that I would like to use now. Um, student mobility has been affected heavily due to COVID-19 and not only the student mobility, but the whole uh, of uh, the student's life. 
Do you have any sort of coping mechanisms that you offer the students at AUB? I mean, especially Lebanon has been hit hard and uh, these were very sad news for all of us seeing the explosion in the port of Beirut. Um, how have you managed the, the psychology of the students, if we may say so? Uh, thank you for the question. Actually, our, our problems began about a year ago, uh, on the 17th of October 2019, with the so-called revolution uh, that, that, that really, you know, everybody, faculty, staff and students were invested in, in a sense. And that actually stopped, um, you know, we had to actually close down the university for several weeks. And we actually had to experiment with the whole online learning um package uh then so when covid hit us in march we were kind of ready for it but in the meantime there's been a lot of political turmoil and there's been financial major financial stress because of the devaluation and so our students are are struggling on so many levels and so many levels that are actually more challenging than covid itself um and and the main the main uh, the main challenge for our students is payment of fees right now because of the extreme devaluation. So um, I think um, um, my colleague at AUC mentioned some coping mechanisms that AUC are you know uh, using. We have very similar you know we have very similar services for students, a wellness center, a accessible education center, all of this has been moved online. Of course, uh, there's the counseling center has been key because people are literally, I mean, um, everybody's sort of having a meltdown. Um, so it's very important to have these support services and to, to be able to offer them virtually um, because of course, in-person is a challenge. Um, the other the other coping mechanism has been really to try to raise funds, uh, raise funds through scholarship programs, individual donors to support students who can no longer who are maybe in the middle of their degree and they just they, their parents simply can no longer pay the fees. Um, to date, AUB has been charging tuition at the original exchange rate of 1.5, but that's not sustainable in the long term. And of course, eventually that's going to have to change. But you know, this is this is the main the main stress for the administration and for the students. Um, and so, and and there has been downsizing. You've probably all heard about. Um, you know, there were there were some job losses at the university. A lot of downsizing because in or, in order to be able to maintain the financial, you know, some financial stability. So we have partners like the Mastercard Foundation, USAID, US State Department, and so on. And these. These are coming through for us and they're continuing to fund us with maybe possibilities for more funding for more students over the long term. And then, of course, there's Erasmus Plus, which has been amazing um, at keeping, you know, at keeping us afloat, at, at least in terms of individual mobilities for faculty, staff and students. And now there's a push to allow or to, to, to sort of um, to yeah, to allow an online virtual exchange, and I just uh, I just presented actually at one of the um, at one of the councils for well the council for associate deans a, a proposal to approve virtual exchanges for um, for the spring, and that went through um, on the basis that we will probably be online anyway. So, um, but I think I think so. These are some of the coping mechanisms, including pushing really pushing the the idea of the online online learning for our students abroad abroad virtually abroad so yeah i hope that answers your question yes very well thank you hella i just have a small uh, question um i think uh, yeah you it's right it all started for you uh, uh, already last year so it this means you had your time to to cope with the whole situation and smooth in more easily than maybe other universities that were just hit hard um, by the shock starting maybe March 2020. But what about the numbers of students that maybe started applying this year? Did you see a difference? I mean, you already said there are financial difficulties that the students were facing, but did it also maybe in terms of students traveling abroad, where are they now staying home because of the closed borders and would they be applying to it? Yeah, it's... <laughs> yeah, so I would say before August 4th, uh, before the explosion, mm -hmm. we we were sort of we realized that actually a lot of students were not going to be able to leave the country to get their education, their full education abroad. 
because of the financial situation. So we were actually going to be okay in terms of the numbers. But after August 4th, a lot of people who were sitting on the fence about staying or leaving yeah. left. In a, in a, I mean, there was a sort of a yeah. feeling of panic and, and fear. So a lot of people left, um, people who's, who, who would have otherwise enrolled at AUB. Um, on the other hand, so those who ca- many of those who can leave are leaving or have left, and those who can't, can't really pay their fees or can but are struggling to. So it's a difficult situation. So post August 4th, we definitely saw a drop. So it's really related to that more than COVID. COVID actually was an opportunity to to keep students in a sense because the whole world is affected by COVID and parents didn't want to send their, their children abroad because of COVID. They preferred to keep them here. Mm-hmm. But the but the explosion changed the the equation actually for us. Yeah. And, and did you also notice a change in the international research cooperation that you have with different universities? No, no actually, I would say that, that that has improved in a sense. I think that we've had a lot of support. A, a lot of our partners have actually come through and are trying to help us either, you know, by, by let's say, in some cases, offering free courses online for our students or offering free uh, support in terms of capacity building for online learning. Or we have a we had a partnership which before the summer was just a capacity building partnership, but now it's become with a, a Arizona State University where they're offering uh, many of their courses, you know, to our students. Uh, if they're not being offered at AUB, they're saying that our students are welcome to take their courses. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there we had um, outreach from uh, Science Po, which is a very strong uh, partner. Uh, uh, you know, supporting our librarians with resources from the library. So there's been, I wouldn't say that research has been compromised. I think this has been actually an opportunity for people to go beyond the physical boundaries and to realize that they can actually collaborate virtually. It's not the same, uh, but it's it works. Um, it works. And, and in the interim, it's, it's a great solution, I think. Thank you very yeah. much, Hella. Thank you. Florian? Yeah, um, Professor Abdel Magid Kasim, if we speak about research agendas, national and international research agendas, I think there's, you're very well placed to, to answer this topic. So you're the professor of endemic disease at Cairo University. Um, you have done part of your studies, I think, uh, your PhD uh, with the support of the German Academic Exchange Service at uh, or Friends University, the Technische Universität München. Um, but you're a friend of many university, German universities, uh, not only because of your research collaboration, but also because of your closeliness. Um, with the networks uh, of the German Academics, uh, German Academic Exchange um, Service. And the interesting thing is also that you are product, uh, you are conducting many different research projects and also humanitarian projects with partners in Africa and Asia. And uh, you had several consultancy activities within the Egyptian Ministry of Higher Education and Research, the Ministry of Health, and uh, also the uh, Academy of Scientific Research and Technology. So um, I would like to ask you, um, how do you observe um, doing research um, during this crisis? And do you see a shift in governmental policies in Egypt, Middle East, uh, when it comes to, to research priorities at the moment? And where would you say are now, uh, where would we sort of also see our priorities in terms of engaging into uh, transnational research cooperation between Egypt and Germany? Thank you very much for this uh, question, Florian. Um, indeed, the pandemic posed a great challenge uh, to the scientific community worldwide. Um, and it, it looks like that uh, the scientific community was not uh, well prepared for such a challenge for, of this magnitude. Um, this has been evident uh, in the first weeks of the spread of disease, of the, when the information came from China that there is uh, something uh, Strength there, a new virus, etc. 
Um, and then we were confronted with a lot of reports, scientific reports coming from China of very of varying quality and uh, contrad contradicting the results, uh, and we were not able to um, manage the situation indeed. Um, uh, the scene, the publishing, the scientific community, the research, the publishing uh, scene um, was very, uh, was set at, um, was a little bit, um, uh, disorganized during the early weeks of the uh, pandemics. Um, the selection of the papers to be published, to be communicated to the scientific community, were uh, not well selected often uh, because of the research which has been done, done rapidly. Uh, because this is a pandemic, the threat, uh, results had to be generated very rapidly. So the quality of research was uh, sometimes lacking, and so the uh, it was the the, the uh, publishing scene was something like a jungle where you find some good research and a lot of low quality research, and it was very challenging for the individual researcher to uh, depict these uh, uh, articles. One of the big lessons of the pandemic is uh, to scrutinize data coming from other institutions. Uh, one of the great lessons is that during a pandemic, during a crisis, you need research of good quality, but also which can yield rapid, tangible results. Um, and sometimes the uh, uh, classic research pathway which means planning of research, getting funded for research, uh, obtaining your results, and then publishing. This cycle is too long for a decision maker, for a policy maker. And therefore, some areas, some governments, for example, in Germany, in North Rhine Westphalia, where uh, the the uh, the uh, Prime Minister there assigned a study directly to a research group in Bonn to do to conduct this a study, uh, irrespective of uh, where it's going, uh, and to utilize the data directly for decision making. That means the uh, the distance between policy maker, decision maker, and researcher at one point came very 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 close to each other. This was an interesting uh, phenomena. Um, for uh, many parts of the world, this was considered unprecedented, but very practical, because the other way around to wait to, the, to go through the classic pathway would be time consuming, which we cannot afford during a pandemic. So we are focusing more now on research which can yield rapid results and tangible results to be utilized during the pandemic. We don't want results which may be utilized after the pandemic, which when it's going to be too late. And so we are focusing more on practical research. Um, we were in a discussion in a, a few days ago on how to prioritize uh, uh, research and how to spend on research in, some, in, in, in one of the organizations. And we said, okay, one of the parameters uh, which we're going to um, omit or neglect a little bit is the publishing, where the results are going to be published. If we have a good auditing system, to scrutinize the data, to scrutinize the quality of research, but to yield, to avail the research data to the public and to the policymakers immediately. So the, can, the policymaker can utilize the results of research. So we, the, one of the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the great lessons of the pandemic is practical research. Um, that there is, before embarking on research, it should, should be crystal clear the practical implications of um, this research. We are talking about internationalization and at the beginning of the pandemic, borders were closed in many parts of the world, in most parts of the world. Mobility was very much limited, but uh, still ideas could migrate across borders. And um, 
Uh, and this actually what happens uh, that uh, um, individual research groups communicated, we communicated very early with our Chinese colleagues, even during January, to, to, to ask them what's going on, what is there, what should we uh, look for, what should we expect. And um, these uh, um, uh, initiatives um, uh, in which each one utilizes his own network um, in, a, in a domain which is completely unknown. I mean, you, you can imagine yourself during the early phase before uh, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, the situation we were as a, as a physician, as a researcher, it is a completely unknown territory for us. We didn't even know where to start. So we, have, we had to rely on the experience of our colleagues who were hit before us. Um, and we were not, uh, we couldn't afford the luxury of waiting for research data. We had to go for the direct contact and try proactively to get the data from where they are made and not to wait for um, uh, publishing. This has pros and it has cons because one of the um, merits of uh, scientific publishing of the peer reviewing process um, where the, uh, the research is scrutinized um, before being made available. But we had to go for that uh, risk during uh, a pandemic. So uh, these are examples of the lessons um, uh, learned uh, during the pandemic. And um, uh, the I mean, this is a mega pro problem, a mega challenge for the whole world. And it was a lesson that uh, not a single country uh, were, is going to be able to combat this alone. Uh, we have to work in alliances. We have to work on consortia. Um, we have um, to harmonize um, our efforts. Um, this is far beyond any single uh, uh, country. One of the interesting phenomena also, which you can, I mean, the role of the industry um, in, in, in research uh, during the pandemic. Um, many of my colleagues, even those who are working in the field of COVID-19, uh, have he hear, heard about some drugs only from uh, the President of the United States. Um, so, um, uh, in spite of the fact that they are experts, but uh, this uh, has shown also that um, in spite of the fact that we have collaborations between the industry um, and uh, the academia in certain areas, for example, uh, the vaccines, Oxford and the pharmaceutical company, for example, and other exa examples in order to expedite the process to get a product available. Uh, but yet it seems that the um, publishing th scene, the scientific publishing, the scholarly publishing scene is sometimes not focusing on major issue and major developments and drug developments, uh, which uh, we are conf confronted with through the media uh, yeah. or through the policy makers. It was a very interesting uh, phenomenon actually. And I think that we are waiting, we, are, we have still to learn we're going to learn a lot from the forthcoming weeks and months, and they're going to be um, very, very exciting. I hope that the development goes in a positive way, in a more positive way. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Jihan, you have a comment uh, on this. Mm. Uh, your mic, please. Oh, uh, <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I just have a question uh, to Dr. Abdel Nigid. Uh, how did you manage to push hard on this impactful, uh, relevant research without having credible data? I'm speaking because uh, the, the committee mentioned the Supreme Committee for this research on COVID. Actually, I'm one of its members under His Excellency, the Minister of Health. And we are facing major problem. Add to this, of course, I'm a professor of epidemiology. We had this problem lacking surveillance data. We have two islands, the islands of the university hospitals with their own set of data and the Minister of Health surveillance data. And there is no any sort of harmony and they refuse to provide us with data. We got four um, uh, projects, research projects, uh, almost three million um, from the STDF and from other agencies. 
and we consider them success, but we're facing a major problem in data acquisition and specifically credible data. Do you think it's enough, as you're saying, to have clinical trials or interventional trials searching for a vaccine or therapy without knowing the trajectory of the disease and the epidemiology of the disease because of the missing uh, credible surveillance data? Thank you. Uh, should I answer directly? Yes, please. And yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for this uh, uh, question, it, which is a very, very valid question, of course. Uh, the uh, flow of data is sometimes less optimal uh, uh, between certain you know, organizations, uh, and it was sometimes easier to get data from abroad than to get data from Egypt. But that, that's why we are researchers, because as a researcher uh, working in a very challenging environment, uh, we have to, uh, and we are facing a lot of knowledge gaps. And in COVID-19, we had a lot of knowledge gaps in Egypt. And as a researcher, we have to be innovative in filling this knowledge gap by all our own research. So you are an epidemiologist, so I'm sure that um, with um, your resources you get from uh, the, the several funding agencies, it, it is possible to do epidemiological studies to get an idea about the truth of the um, epidemic or the, of the pandemic here in Egypt. Uh, we have to fill these knowledge gaps, uh, even if other institutions are not providing adequate uh, data. That's why we are researchers. Mm -hmm. I have a, a, I have sort of a short. Now it's a short question, but it needs probably a long answer. But we are also running a little bit out of time. So, um, but could you just maybe describe because there is a big controversy controversy at the moment in Germany. And as a virologist, you can be very famous, but you also can be very criticized. So you're walking on a very slim line, sort of when uh, when uh, you open your research results to the public. Uh, let's let's. How is the situation in Egypt? How are 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 they listening scholars at the moment? And how is it if you go public? Uh, the question is, is for me. Mm, yeah. So, you yeah. are asking about, uh, we, have a, um, we have several uh, agencies who are in, involved in funding uh, research uh, in COVID-19. Um, the, um, the management is rather centralized. Um, the two key players, as mentioned by Professor Guayfel, are the Ministry of Higher Education and its uh, affiliated institutions, and the Ministry of uh, Health. With the Ministry of Health more focusing on managing the disease itself, um, whereas the more academic part taken over by the, um, uh, the Ministry of Higher Education and affiliated institutions. Uh, of course, uh, we have, uh, let's say, sometimes suboptimal flow of information in terms of quantity and speed between the uh, different institutions. Um, this is um, a challenge we have been facing not only during COVID, but it's more striking during COVID because the expectations during COVID are much higher, but even before uh, COVID. Um, that the um, uh, information uh, and the uh, oh, related to one institution is lacking another institution. The, uh, the, the institution of the institution may be just uh, uh, across the street. Um, um, there, there are many, many, many reasons. It's uh, it's beyond the scope of discussion. Beyond the scope of this discussion. Uh, so um, we are trying to, there, there are efforts done at the Ministry of Higher Education and the Ministry of Health to harmonize the research initiatives of the institutions. Um, because actually we have, we should have had an advantage here in Egypt because we are abiding to a central protocol, a protocol which, uh, a treatment protocol, a management protocol, which has been set centrally by the Ministry of Health. So this is in contrast to many uh, other countries where uh, the management is so is not that centralized. So actually, you, we should have been in a position to do um, 
much trials and there, there are uh, ongoing uh, clinical uh, trials, uh, um, drug trials, for example, but the, um, uh, the opportunities for conducting trials and research, the potential is very, very high. How much is this really utilized? We have to observe. We have to observe the data, which is which are going to come. I hope within the forthcoming uh, weeks, whether these uh, the magnitude and the quality of these data reflect the um, centralized uh, process management process of um, um, planning of the uh, pandemic uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Health. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Abdelmagid. I think this is a, was a very good overview already on the, the, the challenges researchers are facing in this situation and also the new ways of communication uh, we need in terms of transnational research. We will certainly get back to you uh, on Africa later, but now I would like to hand over to the donor side, to the German Academic Exchange Service, and Hoda will present uh, Isabel Miri. Yes, thank you very much, Florian. Uh, as he already mentioned, now we're zooming out a bit from the university level to go to a more um, to a larger uh, level, which is the donor or the funding agency. Uh, while you are representing around 400 German universities and research centers, of course, there are a lot of uh, questions that, especially now in the times where the um, change by exchange was, is quite difficult. Um, there are questions that we would need to uh, pose. But first of all, of course, I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Isabel Mehring, uh, um, which, who is the director of the DHD Cairo office since the 1st of October 2018. Uh, she studied applied linguistics and translation as well as German as a foreign language at Saarland University. After having worked for the Italian consulate in Saarbrücken and the state media authority in Saarland, uh, Isabel Mehring joined the German Jordanian University in Amman, Jordan in 2006 as a DAD lecturer to build up the MA study program German as a foreign language in order to train future teachers for German language and culture. Um, you have also you have joined the DAD also um, from 2011 to 2013 as a DAD lecturer at the Salahuddin University in Abil, Kurdistan, Iraq where she built up a German uh, language department and study program for German as a foreign language. Uh, in July 2013, she joined the DAD headquarters in Bonn in the field of transnational education and oversaw projects in the Middle East and Africa. So I think your CV already shows that you have a lot of experience in the whole region, um, which could also serve us now in giving us an overview on the whole, uh, on the whole uh, problems that we're facing at the moment. So again, DAD, uh, I think this is also uh, a name that uh, no, there are no researchers in Egypt or anywhere around the world. Anybody who's interested in studying or doing research in Germany does not know this name. Of course, we're also very happy again to be located here on the beautiful premises of the DAD Cairo office. Um, but again, regarding the work that the DAD office is doing here, and you're also as a regional office, you are responsible for Egypt and Sudan. Um, how were your activities affected? I mean, the activities to a great extent depend on the, um, on the exchange between uh, whether it was students or researchers, the international cooperation projects that you were funding over the years and are still funding, of course. How were your activities uh, impacted during the past seven months since this, uh, since this crisis started? Yeah. I hope you can hear me well. Please allow me also first. From it's Adelaide. a bit. If you can, if you can raise can your you voice a bit. Yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yes. This is better. Yeah. Is okay. Okay. Good. So um, thank you very much uh, for introducing me and the DAD. Um, I would also like to congratulate the Freie University in Berlin and especially also the Vice President Professor Blechinger. Um, to this 10th anniversary, and I would have loved to, um, of course, to host you here also on our premises. But I hope it will be the situation will be better soon, and we can uh, we can still meet. Um, uh, but yeah, let me get back to your question also. How have we been affected? Of course, we have been affected in our work, like all the other institutions. Um, we had to um, also close down uh, the office. We are not open for public at the moment. 
and of course we had to make a priority um, uh, for with regard to the health and the safety of our team, also of the offices, of course, we have here on the, on the premises, and also with regard to our clients, that means students, researchers, and so on. So this, I mean, it doesn't mean that we are not active. Um, we have uh, been able, I'm very happy and very proud also to say this, and this is thanks to our team, we have been able to react uh, almost immediately after the first shock when, when we had to adapt all, uh, our, all. Uh, but we have been able to transform a lot of our activities into online formats and to open our doors as a funding agency and as an advising agency as well um, online. So um, we are doing our advising with regard to studies and research in Germany online or via email or also via phone. We have special um, appointments um, organized by the team. We um, offer our online info sessions online for the different target groups. And, um, but we also have uh, had to rethink um, our very special programs and, uh, and uh, activities with regard to, for, for example, the DRD Cairo Academy. And it was also possible to um, immediately um, react, um, react and our trainers were able also to switch from um, the on-the-spot meetings also to online formats. And we were also um, possible, and I really thank certain trainers of our team, um, to um, include also uh, modules and capacity building with regard to the current uh, situation. So that means online teaching, taking your classroom online. What, what about, what is digitalization? What does it mean? And how can we, how can we change also our activities? Um, uh, the German Science Day, for example, this is an institution since many years, and I'm happy that also Freie Universität Berlin was able to join us this year. It was not held on a single day um, in a nice, um, uh, on, a, on a nice premises, but um, we were able to um, transform this into a whole German Science Week, and we also had a very good outreach with regard to um, to the public. So. Um, I mean, our work has been affected, of course, because mobility is not possible at the moment, also for us as a team. Um, it uh, doesn't mean only that we are not active and can go into the region, for example, to Sudan, where I have last been um, in uh, at the end of February, and it's really, um, um, I can also, um, I totally agree with uh, Professor Blechinger, who said that COVID-19 is not the only crisis. Uh, if we think about Sudan, for example, it uh, has not been possible for me or for the team to go there for the uh, in the last year because there has been a political crisis. So we were really happy to join Sudan and to go to Khartoum once again to um, to to um, to start our work with the ministry um, and with the partners uh, once again this year. And uh, after I came back, actually at the at the end of uh, February, one week later, everything has changed once again. So um, you can see that also mobility within Egypt nowadays is not possible. We are working online, we are communicating online. And at least, I mean, I have to say that um, the personal exchange um, cannot take place at the moment, not in the dimensions we know it from before. But um, as digital um, tools are available, and we are talking since uh, many years also about digitalization strategies, um, at least um, for the time being, we are able to act very well and to communicate and also to enhance um, scientific cooperation. And this is what we have already done. And I would like to mention also a public lecture as um, our dear partner, Professor Dr. Abdel Megid Kassem is here. We had a public lecture um, uh, last month with uh, partners from Morocco, from Jordan and from Germany and of course Egypt to talk about um, health issues to talk about COVID-19 and it was very um, interesting for us and for, um, for, um, for our audience to discuss how different countries are dealing with this uh, pandemic. Thank you very much uh, Isabel. Um, I just have another question um, because the essence of the AD is of course the mobility and yes there have been a lot of activities here in the Cairo office or via the Cairo office um, in the digital format, but how do you see, or what are the strategies that you have maybe already envisioned if the if this whole COVID-19 situation persists? Because at some point, 
I mean, you have running uh, scholarship programs with the Egyptian Ministry of Higher Education, the, the long-term scholarship or the short-term scholarship. Um, were these affected as well uh, in terms of um, are people still able to travel? The whole visa issue, I think uh, a lot of people can like tell a, a whole book about the, the problems of getting a visa. But of course, being a DAD scholarship holder, you have this uh, very special status. So do you have to, to summarize, how are you dealing with the whole uh, travel restriction problem? And at the same time, uh, do you see already a shift in numbers of people applying for the short-term or the long-term scholarship uh, uh, programs that you have? Um, it's a good question because I think the travel restrictions um, are um, very uh, difficult to handle for all of us. I mean, we need the scholarship. We, 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 we can't hear you that way. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, it's but, better. Thank you. Yes, it's better. So I, I closer to the microphone. Um, I think the travel restrictions are a big problem for all of us, even not only for scholarship holders, but um, uh, it was also clear for me that um, um, uh, regulations are changing sometimes uh, from one day to another, and uh, you have to you have to bring PCR tests with you, and uh, it's it's very anyhow it's 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 difficult for all of us. As for the visa issues, of course, when we talk about the direction Egypt Germany. Um, of course, we have to. We are still coping with the with the issue, with the challenge. Um, we have not yet solved it, um, uh, but we are on a good way together with the German embassy. Um, I know this discussion is uh, um, is very important for many people, not only the scholarship holders. I mean, also um, people who want to travel to German, students who want, who got um, a place in a German university and are self payers. Um, they face the same problems. Um, I think there are now uh, good steps, and we also have to understand. And I really thank also the I have to thank the German embassy for the continuous cooperation, and we are in direct contact um, to solve to find solutions also uh, at the moment for the time being for the scholarship holders because they are much more much easier to handle um, for the German authorities also because they have a funding um, they have a safe funding. And it's uh, for 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 in, yeah in in terms of uh, financial issues, it's uh, it's much easier also to handle them. So we are now trying to um, to solve the problem, and um, but of course we need some patience. And uh, our scholarship holders have not been affected too much for the time being, and there are no open calls for um, for the long term and the short term scholarships. Uh, we have just selected also in an online session the um, the short term scholarship so we are also on our way to um, uh, to deliver the um, positive and negative answers to the applicants and then we will continue with the next steps but um, yeah I mean we are still as you as you see we are still coping with it but um, uh, it's also we have to understand also the visa sections because they are in the same situation as we are. Um, they have to take care of the procedures. We have the restrictions also um, from the different countries, but um, I, I hope that uh, uh, in the sooner future we will we will find a solution and things will get uh, smoother and uh, we can handle it in in a much better way. I think it's a learning process for all of us, and uh, we are on a very good way. But it was clear that uh, things uh, couldn't couldn't have been handled from one day to another. Yeah, I, I think this is, a, this is an a fact that applies to everything in life at the moment. And nobody would have expected that overnight uh, things change like this and borders uh, are closed. So, uh, yeah, it, it is definitely a learning process. Thank you, Isabel. A bit louder, please. If, if, if I might add also, because you asked me also about DAD and its concept of mobility and change by exchange. Of course, this is our motto, and this will uh, this will be our motto also for the time being. As I have said, um, I think that also for the for the future, virtual formats will be much more important than they have been before. So um, I think we will uh, much more work with digital formats also, and we have to envision also certain new strategies um, because we still don't know. We don't. Uh, we, we cannot look into a crystal uh, glass uh, to see how the future in the next month will be. 
So we have to deal with it because we have to enhance our um, scientific cooperation. But I think also um, what we have what we have heard from Abdel Magid Kassam and also the other colleagues, uh, we are now in the situation that we see that scientific exchange um, is uh, much more important maybe than ever before. And we see a lot of goodwill and a lot of interest also from uh, from the different scientists from all over the world to work together because they see that nowadays these kind of crises, and it's not only COVID-19, it's also the climate crisis, it's also many other topics, they can only be um, dealt with on a global scale. And I think this is the, the best the best way we can act now, um, also to enhance a transnational research and uh, and um, academic exchange. And I think this is also on a very good way. If I see our researchers and uh, and and our possibilities also with different topics um, uh, to uh, to cooperate together. Thank you very much, Isabel. With these words, I give over again to Florian. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, we, we are through sort of with the round, if we include, of course, the input uh, of Verena Blecheger Talcott. Um, maybe you would like to respond to it. I would just uh, make a brief comment uh, in order to um, uh, to provoke you a little bit all at the end. Um, <laughs> uh, ha having, having listened to, to, to all of your remarks, um, I feel that uh, we are still your talking on the one side about the huge opportunities of digitalization and at the other hand I have the impression that we are still all in sort of a situation of struggle of survival. Um, surviving this crisis, having to deal with it, it's not something where we see uh, yet big opportunities, especially when it comes to international cooperation and I fear a little bit that the longer the crisis lasts, that we will have probably a lot of good intentions, but um, we are sort of getting lost more and more in this kind of uh, yeah communication with those who are closed, etc. The, the meetings we have to have every day instead of really um, building up new partnerships. Now, just as maybe uh, one uh, sort of um, yeah, word uh, thrown here into the arena. Um, Professor Blechen, the, the Freie Universität is building up together with its partners, the Berlin Center for Global Engagement. Um, after listening to our colleagues in Beirut and, 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 and Cairo, where do you see the particular chances of, of, of sort of enhancing partnership on a global scale? Uh, auf Augenhöhe, as you said, uh, you have said in your speech, and um, yeah, maybe you have also some comments on what has been mentioned, the, the financial struggle of AUB, for example, but also uh, Abdel Magid's uh, remarks on publication regimes. Um, I think there is a lot of points. So maybe you might comment on that. And uh, to, 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 to finish uh, yeah, uh, on that, there was just one remarks because I would also like to, to guide over to our questions. Um, the important lesson of COVID-19 is that the world realized the importance of global unity and global goal efforts and interests. So, but how, how are we going to translate this in instruments in tools that uh, we can work on as university leaders? Oh, uh, thank you, Flo. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's quite an order um, at the end. Um, well, let me, let me first say I was... I'm, I'm, as, as I was introduced, I'm a Japan Studies scholar, and the word for crisis, uh, the flip side is always opportunity. No? So in that way, I think the only chance we have as, as universities to get out of this crisis undamaged is to see what we are, first of all, to focus on our strengths, um, what we can do, and on the other hand, to see how we can use this crisis to then uh, find new ways to make these strengths really uh, sustainable. So in that way, one, one thing that we see um, in, in our panel today is that we can actually have a very good and lively and inspiring discussion beyond borders in ways that we couldn't have uh, done if we had held this event in the you know traditional way by sitting together, which would also be 
beautiful and really nice but here we have people coming together participating um, that's one of the things that we could do more with bring the world to your classroom um, open up courses um, establish uh, new ways for exchange research exchange that also offers opportunities for uh, scholars who have probably less um, money and 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 resources to travel to international conferences by by digitalizing things we could um, establish and support collaboration with um, you know better ways of uh, bringing people in who otherwise would probably be standing outside or would have to um, raise funds to actually being able to travel so i think that would be one of the challenges and uh, by doing so handing it of course all back to you as the head of the center for global engagements that would be one of the challenges for the center for global engagement to think about formats that allow this participation um, in in a way um, that allows us to move forward exchange and collaboration through digital tools, through a smart use of digital tools. Um, I think that would be that would be one very, very quick answer for that. I very much like the question about the importance of global unity in uh, global goals, efforts and interests. Um, and I just really strongly support that if we don't stick together um, and if we don't think about what we can do as researchers, where our strengths are, if we don't work together, then this crisis will divide us. Um, and that will be a shame and a damage, not just to our individual institutions, but to scholarship and uh, to the future of the next generation. So we cannot let that happen. Maybe that for now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, the next question um, is from our colleague Sarah Wessel. Uh, she, has a main, she has many questions, but one of them is, um, what should universities in Germany do to foster research cooperation also now by digital means with public universities uh, in Egypt in particular? Um, maybe Dr. Chihan and Dr. Abdul Magid, you can uh, give us two or three words about where would you see the priorities here, what we can do? Um, who wants to come first, Dr. Chihan? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, do you mean priority uh, in the themes or methodology of collaboration? Mm -hmm. What exactly do you mean? For example, if the themes we do already have a priority list uh, mentioned by the CDC and the WHO, which are the benchmark of ours in all aspects, including even to reopen the universities. And I wished I had chance to ask you, how did you re reopen in Germany? But unfortunately, I didn't have this chance about the calculator and how do you manage? But in my opinion, it's very important to do a sort of um, um, uh, what we call the non-traditional epidemiology of the disease, by which I'm speaking about mechanistic models, uh, forecasting models, trajectory, because uh, it's very common. All epidemiologists say that this disease, it came to stay it will not end and a lot of things will stay as it is and we have we, we have a line of demarcation between pre and post covid in all aspects not just in research in all aspects so we have to adapt and we have to manage and to, to do this the most important is to have a, a full epidemiological profile uh, multi centric multi uh, international about how this disease manages in all countries so this is very important, but unfortunately, I'm saying the most important thing to hold this is the availability of credible data. So it's the epidemiology of the disease. Um, second, of course, the therapy and the vaccine, the clinical trials are already moving, as Dr. Abdel Nigid Qasim mentioned. But as I mentioned, the trajectory is very important. This is the link nowadays about bioinformatics and so on. They're working on this, on how to predict or to forecast the disease trajectory or trend in the next years. As long as it's going to stay, we have to know how will it move. Some people are saying we're facing a second wave. Others saying we are not. In Germany, they deny having a second wave. Here as well, we're denying, but we cannot confirm this because we don't have a, a unified track or set of data. 
actually I'm working with um, a scientist in Germany, uh, a professor actually on the epidemiology and forecasting models of the disease in Egypt and in Germany. And I hope it's, it's, uh, it gets to be published soon, inshallah. This, I think, is the most important priority epidemiology. And one thing is very important I want to add regarding how we reopen the universities. We've all been mentioning uh, that we, in Egypt, it's different maybe from Germany, because in Germany and USA and UK, each university has some sort of individual individuality open or not to reopen. But here in Egypt, we all follow one uh, body, uh, uh, superior body, of course, the, the, the Supreme Council. But I, I didn't find in any of the universities a toolkit for risk assessment or risk calculator, which allows certain university to reopen or not. For example, Oxford, uh, because they didn't uh, show their, their full data about uh, if they are ready or not, they were banned to open. We should have something like this here in all the institutions, but reopening like this because we have to reopen and we all, all abide by this on the 17th of October, this doesn't make sense because most probably you will reclose again. So you should have this risk assessment calculator and this should be uh, one of the joint researches, of course, between different universities to find a calculator of the risk assessment and scores international wise. Thank you. Okay, I, I can see here the wish to, to establish global uh, parameters for risk assessment. Um, that would be uh, indeed uh, uh, a very interesting thing. Dr. Abdel Magid, you maybe want to say also something about the tools for digital cooperation? Uh, well, I would like course. to, uh, to um, to thank my colleague, uh, Professor Guayfel, for uh, her elaboration. Uh, I would like to add. Uh, one important thing, a, practic a very, very practical issue, which I really made use of uh, in my research. I mean, the, the we are Egypt is lagging chronologically in the during in the pandemic about four to eight weeks. So the events which happen in Europe, we are we can predict that as there is an analogy uh, after four to eight uh, weeks in Egypt, and uh, during this window um, in March. I communicated with my German colleagues um, who were in, already embarked on research, and uh, there was a know-how transfer on the methodologies used. I mean, the different kits for uh, for the antibody detection, for the serological diagnosis of uh, COVID-19. These were new kits; we nobody had experience with them. But the Germans, our colleague, my colleagues in Germany, had the experience with the different kits, and so they advised me which kit to use, for example. Um, and also co concerning uh, patient uh, patient care, this, the same was also. We had uh, connections with our uh, colleagues in the university hospital, particularly in my case in Munich, um, where we um, reviewed how they are treating the patients there, which medication they are taking, and so on. And we are trying try to implement this or to uh, transfer these data to my colleagues. So to make use of this window, this lag, um, and of course, the very famous uh, uh, paper from the Imperial College about uh, mitigation and suppression, which was the basis of decision making by many policymakers. I mean, it's, we made use of it that we have con con communication with our colleagues and the Imperial uh, um, College. Um, so we are the pandemic has is very dynamic um, with peaks uh, and lows. Um, not simultaneous in different parts of the world. So there is a peak in Germany, uh, there may be a, a low in Egypt and vice versa. Uh, the pattern of abidement to certain non-pharmaceutical measures, like for example, social distancing and so on, this differs completely in Egypt than in, in Germany, for example. Um, and these are very simple ideas of comparative research, for example. Uh, how effective is social distancing? I mean, if we open very rapidly, um, if we have um, business as usual, almost business as usual, many parts of Egypt, uh, how is the burden of disease um, compared to um, a more uh, a community which, which, which is more disciplined uh, towards um, um, uh, in respect to uh, social distancing? 
Um, there are also uh, many hypotheses about immunological um, aspects of disease and uh, correlation with ethnicity and so on. There is a room, um, uh, there's a potential of collaboration, much room for, col for, for collaboration, which is far not utilized yet, um, and uh, which ha we have to utilize to make use of it. Um, and uh, you, you, your question, Florian, I, I deviated from your question. You were asking about digitization. Yeah, the, the, <clears throat> especially the tools for digital cooperation between uh, German and Egyptian universities. The level of co 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 collaboration, like acoustically, I have problems. Oh, okay, the, the, no, the tools for digital cooperation to reinforce in this situation digital cooperation between um, German and Egyptian universities. Well, um, I have to say that uh, I have an intensive collaboration like um, never before. Uh, when I was able to travel um, every week to Germany. Uh, and you know, Florian, uh, <laughs> there was some time which, uh, I, um, in which I was, uh, I was traveling almost a week uh, uh, to Germany. Um, but, uh, and now with the, these tools, uh, we are in an in, in intensive um, uh, contact. We are doing our phone conferences. We are doing... Uh, um, uh, video conferences, uh, we are presenting sometimes cases and we discuss cases. So um, these uh, digital platforms really um, are uh, paid off now. Uh, I can see the, the potential, I can feel it. Um, um, we are designing projects, we are working on projects together. Um, we are continuing our collaboration. We have a project with the um uh with with german universities in northern african countries and we shifted uh the teaching modules into an online uh, course and uh, this was an opportunity for, because we were able to uh include also sub-saharan african countries so in instead of traveling there we are uh, preparing the module and we said okay the module is going to prepare why not to inc include other areas because the travel costs are none so why not to include P uh, our colleagues from sub-saharan africa uh, we are going to uh, launch a course in uh, at the beginning of december uh, we are recognizing opportunities which we didn't have before we are recognizing this uh, right now. Um, uh, we are working with the um, uh, with the DRD on a, on a very comprehensive uh, program, and um, um, you have you, you were talking about global responsibilities, and the DRD has uh, has launched um, a program uh, for, of uh, creating pandemic uh, center or centers of. Uh, global centers of infectious diseases. Um, I mean, work is going on. Um, I don't complain, I don't complain of less work, of less networking, of less collaborations with my partners, every part in the world. China, I've never been to China, but um, in, in January and March, in February, I had intensive contact with my Chinese colleagues. Uh, and it was, uh, of course, we, we learned at this very early stage of the pandemic. We've learned, I've, I've learned a lot from the, from my Chinese colleague. I've never been to China. I know, so uh, for me, uh, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, let's hope only that we uh, can, uh, that we all um, keep ourselves healthy and we um, survive this pandemic uh, healthy with much more opportunities. Thank you. Ja, Frau Mehring. Um, let, me, let me just add also, um, as uh, Professor Abdel Megid has already mentioned, the DAD. Let me also add that uh, um, the DAD headquarters um, ha was able to establish also as a direct reaction to the current situation different new funding programs um, with a focus on digitalization. So uh, maybe I can give also the, the data to Huda El-Mahrub and she can also 
um, write it to the to the whole uh, audience. Um, it is, for example, um, the uh, International Mobility and Cooperation through Digitalization Program. It's the so it's also the um, so-called IVAC program, which is. the IP Digital, the um, international programs digital. So um, there is a lot of also possibilities between different countries um, to um, write uh, teaching concepts, for example, um, on a, in a digital way and uh, to cooperate um, intensively also in this uh, situation and uh, to overcome the crisis and the challenges. Um, I think my team can give you also the details and uh, you can we can share that also with the audience to give an idea what uh, what kind of funding is also possible with different partners. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm looking now to Hoda uh, because she um, <laughs> has the eye on the times. I don't know. <laughs> yes, yeah, we, we passed our time long time ago, Floria. <laughs> but we I think that the time. Yeah, the, the discussion was too interesting to just cut it short and stop uh, right in the middle. Um, nevertheless, I think a lot of very important and interesting points were mentioned today. And um, as we just said, this, this discussion would actually never stop. Um, we, had a, we, had a, we had a couple of um, keywords that were mentioned, uh, transnational collaboration, um, sustainability in cooperation, Digitalization, of course. Um, I think these are all keywords that will still remain um, till till actually we we get over with COVID nineteen and still further, because um, if anything, uh, COVID has nineteen has taught us it is to to uh, to believe even further in the international academic collaboration. Whether it was as uh, Professor Abdemigid said, the opportunities that we found and and um, whether it was on the international collaboration level or the student mobility or the or the research level, I think COVID-19 has actually taught us a lot of things and it is it can actually be a backdoor remedy uh, to a lot of crises that we are all facing, whether it was COVID-19 or whether it is a revolution like in Lebanon or the problems that we have in Sudan. Uh, this is a global problem, not only regional and yeah, um, I would personally like to thank each and every panelist that we have with us today. You do really all represent uh, very important and very strong partners for us in the region. And without you, uh, our work as a liaison office could not have been done. Also, I uh, don't want to forget our colleagues or my colleagues in Berlin, uh, especially in the Center for International Cooperation, uh, again, without all of you and all the different uh, departments and, of course, the professors that are always willing, uh, willing and motivated to come to Egypt and to give it a try, as we say. Uh, thank you very much from my side. Um, I'm sorry that I had to cut short the discussion, but we have to come to an end at some point. Um, yes, Florian, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, just because... Before you cut short, I would say that everybody should turn its video on and we should turn on also the mics and we make a small birthday photo. We don't have a birthday <laughs> cake, but please, a small birthday photo. That's all what I have to say at the end here. <laughs> Very nice to see everybody that we know, the colleagues. 